right. Well, today we are looking at one of the most difficult areas in the Bible for Christians, the teaching on loving your enemies. It's one of the most difficult things, I think, for many people to swallow, but it is the mark of a true Christian. But before we dive into it, I want to define what love is. In the Greek language, if you spoke Greek, you would recognize different words for different types of love, but in our language, we just say love. I love pizza, maybe a little too much. Um, I love my dog. I love my kids and my wife. I love the sunshine. I, mean, I can go on and on. We use the word love in a lot of different ways. Oh, I love that movie. That movie's great, you know. Um, so in the Greek language, we, we, we see four main words with regards to love. The first one is the word storge, which is a natural family love that you would have for mother, for child, child for parents, or so on, a normal family kind of love. In this love, the word storge doesn't actually appear in the Bible, but the negative form of it does when it's talking about people that don't even have a natural type of love that they should have. It's just not there. And so, storge. There's another word that is very famous in our culture. The word eros, or romantic love. We get our word erotic from this love. This word does not appear in the Bible, but... It does an action, if you've ever read the Song of Solomon, it's all about Eris, love. Then, a word that appears quite a few times in the Bible, phileo, which is brotherly love, brotherly love or friendship or affection that you would have for somebody. And... Many of us are familiar with that word, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, so phileo. And then lastly, and this is the word that we are talking about today, when we say love, love that sees something as infinitely precious and willing to pay the ultimate price for it, the word agape. And so if we were to look at a little graphic here of the English word love, in all the different ways it's translated uh, into love from the original Greek words, the vast majority of them are forms of agape. Um, agape is the noun, agapao being the verb, and so you can see that, that whole huge piece of the pie. Um, so it's in the Bible a lot, and that's the word that we're being taught about, learning to treat somebody as infinitely precious and willing to pay the ultimate price for them. Now, Jesus, is, Jesus used this word in his teaching in John chapter 3 also in a way that might shock you. It says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved, agape, the darkness, rather than the light because their works were evil. Now, if you think about that definition, <clears throat> treating something as infinitely, infinitely precious and willing to pay the ultimate price for it, that somebody would love the darkness so much that they would forfeit their soul to hell forever. That is the love that unbelievers have for their sin, for the world. And so the teaching really that we're being presented with here today is a transferring of that ultimate affection, that ultimate loyalty and love from ourselves to God and others. It's unconditional. Regardless of a person's attractiveness, 
regardless of their worthiness and regardless of any possibility that they would reciprocate that love, we are called to love anyway. This is a love that's based on a decision of the lover, not on the one who's loved. It's evidenced mainly through actions, not words. And so you can tell if somebody truly loves by the way they treat somebody else. For us as believers, if you've come to know Christ and you are a new creation in Jesus, then this is the most important outward evidence of a true new creation. We see that it is encapsulated in the first and second greatest commandment of all times. The first being, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Treat Him as infinitely Precious, willing to pay the ultimate price for God. And the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who is your neighbor? Well, in the Bible, Jesus says, well, for you Jews, your neighbor is the hated Samaritan that's walking down the road and that gets attacked. And the self-righteous religious people walk on by, oh, it's just a filthy Samaritan. Or actually... The Samaritan's the one who loved the person that was beat up. Anyway, just put up with me. I woke up at uh, 4 in the morning, which in Hawaii was 1 in the morning. So I'm a little bit backwards in my brain right now. The Samaritan was the good neighbor. You know, he loved the person that was beat up while the self-righteous religious folks walked on by. If you have true faith in Christ, it's expressed in love. Check this out. In Galatians 5, 6, it says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. No religious outward ritual, but only faith working through love. It's the only thing that counts. If you really want to say, man, that person's life made a difference in this world, Their faith was real. I know they're a new creation. It's faith in Christ, which creates a new creation that works out through love. Love is not a prerequisite to salvation, but it's a result of your salvation. It's something that God does in you. And so as we look at this today, I don't want us to be feeling condemned by everything that we are not yet, but rather be challenged by everything that God wants to make us into. And the great thing is that he wills to work in you according to his will and according to his purposes and promises and all those great things. He's the one that ultimately accomplishes what we're about to read today but we can choose to partake in the process or resist. And resisting is not a good idea. Never fun. But if you could imagine a heavenly being stepping out from the holiness and purity of heaven and the perfect relationship of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the angels and Walking on this earth, I think the most horrifying thing, worse than any horror movie, worse than any war scene that could ever be experienced, would be to see how people treat each other. That extreme of going from love to seeing hate in action, I would imagine, would be horrifying for any holy heavenly being. And so for us today, as we live in this world, we've gotten kind of used to it. We're somewhat dull to how horrifying it really is. To the point to when we hear what love really looks like, it's almost shocking in the other direction. Offensive to the natural person, but to the supernatural 
what we're about to study today makes a lot of sense. In verse 27, it says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. This is a very unnatural command to our flesh. As you hear it, your flesh is actually probably offended. You might even find yourself arguing with these words. Well, but that doesn't apply to this person or that person or this situation or that person situation. And we, we try to find excuses and loopholes to not have to obey the command to love our enemies. But notice who Jesus is talking to. You who hear. There were a lot of people there in this crowd listening. Some had ears to hear. Those true disciples, not just the casual listener, not just the casual attendee, but one who truly had put their faith in Christ and the Spirit was speaking into their hearts. Those who are spiritual are called to this high standard, not those who are natural, those who are spiritual. True love, spiritual love, Heavenly love, this divine agape love, loves its enemies. So when people hate you, for the nation of Israel, their enemies were a real threat to their actual existence on earth. Hating enemies seems to be supported in the Old Testament. Have you ever read it? And you come across those passages, you know, Wipe them out, every one of them, even the animals. You're like, wow, that's pretty intense. So Jesus comes along and he says, love your enemies. That's who he's talking about. The people who threaten their existence. We reconcile these Old Testament stories of hatred and violence when we look at the fact that physical government is established and protected by the use of force, but the kingdom of God is established in a totally different way. Though the world acts with its armies and with its strength, its violence, the kingdom of God conquers with love. When it comes to the gospel, People are not safe by force. You can't force somebody into the kingdom. You can get them to conform to certain expectations if you use violence. But their hearts will not be transformed. They're conquered by love instead. Why is it that the church grows the fastest when it is being persecuted? Because the love of Christ shines brighter in the darkest time. The kingdom of God conquers with love. When people curse you, when people abuse you, and we are living in an age when the actual hostility towards Christianity is growing. The, the world is not becoming more friendly to the name of Christ or to the scriptures. It's becoming more hostile. I had just heard this week that somewhere in California they want to ban the Bible. Um, everybody who's tried to do that throughout history, it's never turned out well for them. But this is our country. Man, crazy. But we live in an age when cursing of Christians and the, the abuse of them is not only happening widespread, but people are kind of going, Ugh. Oh, yeah, I guess that happened. You know, some people got beheaded for their faith and stuff, and, and the media doesn't quite take notice. But we as believers, we don't respond with anger and hatred and violence in return. Instead, we're told that we can use our words by blessing 
those who hate you. Bless those that curse you. Have you ever done that before? Blessing, actually, somebody that says something nasty about you and your faith? Or, if you've been abused, Jesus says, pray for those that abuse you. It goes on to verse 29. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. You know, when we think of the word strikes you on the cheek, I don't know, in my mind, from the years that I grew growing up, I imagine a guy pulling a little glove out of his pocket and going, psh, psh, you know, I challenge you, psh, you know, or that wasn't very nice, psh you know, slapping you on the cheek. But this word cheek actually means jawbone or chin. Think of it more like an uppercut. When I was in elementary school, we used to play street everything, street kickball, street football, street um, baseball. But we would play street baseball with a kickball and a normal bat, you know. And so um, one day, that's... Not good physics, by the way. <laughs> you know, we stopped doing that, actually. But one day, somebody was at bat, and I was pitching. My brother was in the outfield, and I threw the ball, and somebody hit a pop fly. So I'm running out to it. My brother's running to it. And the next thing I know, I'm on the ground, and my brother's on top of me, and he won't move. We had run smack into each other in my... I right here hit his chin and knocked him out. Boom. Sliced my eye open. I had blood just coming all over the place. So everything I saw was red. And then, and then my, I'm like, get off. Get off me. You know, and I was smaller than my brother at the time. Bigger than him now. He doesn't mess with me anymore. But, uh, and then he wakes up. What happened? You know, and anyway, um, my brother's, he walks back to our house uh, disoriented, and then I walk back limping and blood all over the place, and my mom comes out the front door and flips out, you know, drives us to the emergency room, and the whole time my brother's like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Throws up a little bit, and then, what happened, you know? Um, but that's what I think of now, understanding this word cheek, turn the other cheek. It's like you get an uppercut. And it's violent, not just a little slap. It gives the impression that in those days anyway, it allowed you to take the aggressor to court if they gave you an uppercut like that. You could take them before a judge. And so the natural reaction is to take him to court or to strike back Nobody would fault you for it. Totally within your rights. And I've always told my kids, you have the right to defend yourself at school. It's your choice to turn the other cheek, but it's your right to defend yourself. So you make the call. I'll support either one. But Jesus tells Christians to turn to them the other side of your jaw. That speaks of an attitude that does not seek revenge, but rather prepares itself to accept another injury if necessary. Though the Old Testament taught eye for an eye, Jesus shows us mercy is supreme. So he also said, when people steal from you, your cloak. A cloak was a normal outer garment. The tunic that it speaks of was the inner garment. Both were expensive, and most people only had one of each. The Old Testament law actually would forbid the taking of a cloak in a pledge past sundown because that person would need their cloak as a blanket. 
uh, for warmth at night or whatever. And so um, for many, it was their only blanket. It was used as a sack sometimes to carry things in, sometimes a pad to sit on. Um, If you're into the kind of camping where it's like the minimalist kind of camping, you would love these days. The minimalist had a cloak and a tunic and survived. But what we find here is we're supposed to hold things loosely or those things have a hold on you. It's that question we need to ask ourselves. Do you possess your possessions or do your possessions possess you? Jesus is teaching us that personal rights are not more important than being a good witness. So we start to ask ourselves things like, how can I go the extra mile and express the love of God in this situation? Do you have rights? Yes, and you can use them, or you can choose to not use them, but rather show mercy. But that does not mean, and Jesus is not teaching here that you should be a weak doormat that is just abused and used and spit up or chewed up and spit out and saying that's just too bad, that's the way it is. But rather, it's in strength we choose to love. That is the way that we're supposed to follow this command. In strength, we choose to love. We don't cower in fear. Jesus is not prohibiting self-defense, but he is prohibiting retaliation. We don't sit passively as evil goes unhindered. Uh, There are times where we need to stand up. But the principle here is give up revenge and start showing love because that's how God treated you. And Christ actually sets for us the example. He walked this path while he was on this earth. So he's asking us to do something he's actually already done himself. In John 8, 22, it says, when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, Bear witness about the wrong, but if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Notice he didn't strike back or revile. He was respectful. In Luke 23, 34, and Jesus said, and this is while they were dividing his garments and they had spat on him and beat him and crucified him. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. That's the example of Christ. We can practice the same kind of selfless love when we entrust ourselves to God. As it says in 1 Peter 2.23, this is what Jesus did. This is how he made it through. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself. To him who judges justly. So you see Jesus doing two very active things out of strength. Number one, he chooses to love his persecutors. And number two, he entrusts himself to the Father. That's what you can do in those situations. That's how you can love and survive in those tough times. And then we're told what is oftentimes called the golden rule. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Notice what Jesus does not say. He doesn't say, treat people how you feel like treating them in the moment. Most of us live that way, don't we? Treating people how we feel in the moment. Um, Somebody cuts us off, and we say, you're number one. 
you know? Somebody's a jerk and we're a jerk right back, you know? We, we just do what we feel like doing in the moment. Jesus does not say treat people how they wish they were treated. Where does that even stop, right? Or at times, people may wish they were treated in a way that is contrary to Scripture, and we're just not to do that. Uh, We're not told, don't do to others as you would not have them do to you. Um, Although it's similar, it's not the same because that statement is inactive. It is passive. Don't do to others what you don't want done to you. Then you just don't interact. But this statement is active. It says, and as you wish that others would do to you, so do so to them. So we don't follow this command by disengaging with people. We do it by taking action. And we're to do it in a way in which we ourselves would like to be treated. So check this out. We are inherently biased towards ourselves. So say you do something wrong. Um, If somebody else did it, and I know this is how our brains work, we think, I hope they get what they deserve, you know? But somebody sped past me. I hope a cop gets that guy. I've thought it before. But if I'm speeding because I'm late to work, oh, man, I've got reasons. And please, Lord, don't let a cop pull me over. You know, I deserve mercy today. Even if we deserve worse, we hope for better. That's the way we are. We're inherently biased towards ourselves. But we also inherently love ourselves a lot. You are the person you think about the most. We can pretty much guarantee that. People might say, I hate myself. Oh, really? Why don't you tell me how much you hate yourself? I wish I was fat. I wish I was unhealthy. I wish... I've never heard anybody say that. I wish I was more poor. I wish I was disliked by more people. People don't say that. If they really hated themselves, wouldn't they say those things? I hope... Somebody puts me in prison. I hope... No. We inherently love ourselves. The love we're to have for our enemies is that kind of love where we are willing and desire and even take action in ways that we want to be loved. And so Christ throws out this teaching that is so contrary to the world, it's shocking. It could possibly even be offensive. But the last section that we're looking at today in verses 32 through 36, we see our standard for heavenly love. It says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. And so what Jesus is doing, he's throwing out the example of this is the way natural people love each other. I put it in quotes because it's not the kind of love we're talking about. My dog and your pet likely as well, treats you well because you feed them and you you don't attack them. But if you were to attack an animal or be mean to them, they'd be mean right back. Or if you're nice to them, they'll, they'll be nice right back. Because of the animal nature, that's the way they act. So if we love those who love us and we're kind to those that are kind to us, how much different am I than an animal? I'm just doing what natural animals and people do. Christians 
should not love in the same manner as the natural. And so think about that for a second. Is the love that you have for others conditional? I love you if you treat me well. I love you if you talk to me nicely. Or do you have limits? I love these kind of people, but not those kind of people. Well, all of us struggle with that. But in verse 35 through 36, we're given the ultimate standard. The standard is not what the world does. The standard is our Heavenly Father. Check it out. It says, but love your enemies and do good those and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. So Jesus presents a whole new standard. If you're having a really hard time kind of grasping how to love each other, how to love your enemy, Keep your eyes fixed on God. This is what we need to do instead of keeping our eyes fixed on what other people are doing around us. Who is your hero? Who do you look for as your example? We're exposed to a lot of different um, things in our world today, how people respond. I mean, you can get everybody's opinion on social media and cable news channels and everything else. And even if they agree with your political viewpoint, you always still have to ask the question, are they resembling my heavenly father? Well, if they're not, then I don't want to resemble them. Even if they're funny, you know, <laughs> And I love a good comedian and stuff, but there are times when it can cross the line. When we should be loving somebody, we return snarky comments. Believers, we're to be like our Heavenly Father. Whose child do you look like? When um, my brother and I were growing up, um, everybody would say that we looked like our mom. Blonde hair, you know, we, we grew up in California, so our skin was like really brown, and then our hair was almost white, you know, little toehead kids running around, and, and everybody would say, you look like your mom, and then they would look at my dad, and, and he's got dark hair, brown eyes, and dark skin, and uh, they wouldn't say anything, you know, of course, because we didn't look like our dad. And... <laughs> My dad uh, was kind of bummed out about that, but as the years go on, and I've noticed it, and my dad has noticed it, I'm looking more and more like him. I went from, you know, blonde hair to darker hair, a uh, little darker features and stuff. At my 20-year reunion, people were like, did you dye your hair in high school? And like, no, never dyed my hair. But I'm looking more like my dad every day. And as Christians, when it comes to love, we are to be transformed. We're to start to look more like our Heavenly Father every day. In Matthew 5.48, it says it this way, You therefore must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. We live by a higher standard than the world, in anything that the world offers. The kingdom subjects, that's you and me, the children of God, those who have put their faith in Christ, we have this standard that does not conform to a list of laws and rules, but it conforms to a person who we begin to talk like and resemble in our mannerism. So that when people see you, they're like, you remind me of somebody. The way you said that. The way you treated that person. That peace that just surrounds you when hostility is brewing. 
you remind me of our Heavenly Father. You remind me of Christ. Because God loves his enemies. Jesus died for those who hated him. In Romans 5, 8, it says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In that same section, it says we were enemies of God. It was like we had our fists shoved up in his face saying, God, I hate you. Get out of my life. But he still, he died for us when we were at our worst, when we were the most vile and the most sinful and the most disgusting people. That's when he chose to die for you. That's perfect. And so when we're called to be perfect like our Heavenly Father's perfect, that's what it's talking about. The motivation to be like the Father and therefore love our enemies is the highest calling on the face of the earth. And so... Our actions will show who we belong to. So if you look at your life, have you noticed a change from before you knew Christ to today? And again, I don't say these things to discourage you or make you feel condemned, but to rather challenge and remind all of us that we're on a journey of being transformed from who we used to be into children of God. That's what we are now. But what we are has not yet been revealed, John says. It will be one day fully realized. We won't even have to put forth the effort. We'll just naturally do what is like the Father. Man, I look forward to that day. But until then, God's got construction cones around you and signs that say warning. Foul mouth. Warning. You know, might... React strongly, warning, you know. Um, but how nice is it when he takes one of those signs down? Oh, foul mouth, gone. Oh, now he's just got erratic anger problems, you know. Watch out. But we don't earn our sonship. It's something that's given to us. We are sons of God. And we began to look like our Father more and more. And did you guys know that creation is waiting for us to get there? Check this out. In Romans 8, 19, it says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. How cool will it be on that day when it's revealed who the sons of God are and the daughters of God, and when we start acting like it, in fullness, in creation, goes, ah, better than environmentalists, you know, the children of God. But for now, the world will know that you're different by this one thing, love. John 13, 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, and I wrote down the wrong verse, of course, but... Uh, Later on in John 13, they will know that you are disciples by your love for one another. Good thing it's a short verse and I memorized it. <laughs> they will know that you're my disciples but for, for your love for one another. That's how you're set apart in this earth. That you don't just act nice to those who act nice to you, but you are totally different. So concluding... Did you guys know God had every right to condemn us to hell? He had every right when we were his enemies to just flick us off the face of the earth, you know, into a different galaxy or something. But instead he gave us mercy. Instead he chose to love. And because that's what he's done in our life, we choose to love those around us. In 1 John 4, 19, it says we love because he first loved us. That's the beginning of that new life, the new creation. So three things to think about today. Number one, 
And this is what we all need with those construction cones around us and warning signs. Rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. If you truly want to love, you need the Holy Spirit to produce it in you. Because if you look there in your own flesh, it's not there. It's, it's like missing. It's a bare branch. But when the Spirit is present and he is at work in your life, this fruit will be produced. Check it out in Galatians 5, through 23. It says, but the fruit, and the word fruit in the Greek is singular, and some people would make the very strong case that makes a lot of sense. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the fruit, which is also described as love is manifest with joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. If you want to see love in your life, you need the Spirit to produce it. And so rely on Him. Look to Him. Pray. God, you promise that your Spirit will produce this fruit. Please, at work, help there to be one of those fruit that pop out, you know, instead of just the bare branch there. Or in your household, or with your kids, or with your neighbors, or during your commute, rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, resemble your heavenly Father. Let him be who you're looking to be like. Don't, although we enjoy, like, you know, the whole superhero thing, um, the Infinity War just came out and stuff. You know, people are all excited about it. We, we all have like our heroes and people we love to, to read about and, and think about. And that's all fun and stuff. But who is our real hero? Who are we really looking to? It should be God. And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, so we want to resemble our Heavenly Father. And the Spirit is there not only producing the fruit of love, but He's transforming you to look more like Him. It says, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Remember when Moses wanted to see the glory of the Lord, and, and God said, you know, you can't see my whole glory because it's going to incinerate you, so... I'll put you in the rock, cover you up, and then after my glory passes by, you, you'll see the after effects. And it was so powerful, just the after effects, that he came down from the mountain glowing, you know. But when the glory of God was passing by, in Exodus 34, you could read about it, he heard in the cleft of the rock where he couldn't see anything, he heard the glory of the Lord, which was the Lord, the Lord the merciful and compassionate God. And it goes on. And so you see the love of God being talked about. You see the mercy of God being talked about. That's the glory of God. It passes by. And we don't have to be veiled. You know, for Moses, he came down, he was glowing, and then it faded away. But we, because of the Spirit, are being transformed, and we're getting brighter. It does not fade. It increases. So don't lose hope. Keep pressing on to be like your heavenly Father. And when you're not, go to him and say, Father, I am so sorry that I did not represent you as a true daughter or true son. Please forgive me. Help me to reflect you in this area of my life. That blesses the Father's heart. Lastly, do something extraordinary for someone, preferably an enemy. In 1 John 3, 18, uh, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Do something. Not the natural kind of love that's like just kindness to those who are kind or warm feelings when... You know, people are warm-feeling-ish. I don't know. Um, but 
Love somebody supernaturally. Let, love somebody supernaturally. Beyond what's ordinary in this situation. Pray for God to give you the recognition and the strength to act in that moment to show mercy to an enemy, to forgive somebody who wrongs you, to do something good to somebody that totally doesn't deserve it. Pray for that opportunity to do something extraordinary because the more you use these muscles, if you will, the stronger you get the more you will see God work and do amazing things through you. And so, why don't we close in prayer? Maybe where you need to start today is knowing that God loves you. No matter how far away you are, no matter what you've done or what you've said, that he chooses to love you. And he's died for you on the cross. If you want to receive him and his love, forgiveness, become his child today, then pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me when I was seemingly unlovable. Thank you for taking upon yourself all of my sin and shame and dying for me on the cross, paying the price in giving me instead that gift of righteousness and purity. I call out on your name, Lord Jesus, Son of God, save me, a sinner. And I thank you that by faith in you, you give me salvation, you adopt me as your child, and you begin transforming me from the inside out until that day when we see you face to face. Help me to follow you and resemble you on this earth. And God, for all of us, whatever it is that you are challenging us with in our own hearts, and it's probably a face of a person <laughs> that's in our mind, we do pray for the, the power of your spirit to give us the strength to pray for that person, to love that person. And perhaps in some cases, to do something extraordinary for your name's sake. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.